In our darkest times, it can be difficult to find hope, whether personally or through a loved one. Most of us have experienced cancer. The good news, though, is that significant numbers survive the disease today. And our next guest, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and an oncologist. He joined our Walter Isaacson to discuss the complicated landscape of cancer care. Said, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You have a great piece in the New Yorker and a more scientific piece in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science recently, mm -hmm. talking about modifying our white blood cells, our immune system, so that they can hunt down cancer more correctly. Is this a big new way of looking at cancer? It is a. It's a profound new way of looking at cancer, um, and the basis for this really dates back, really almost a century. So. The, the centerpiece of all of this is that for a long time we've been focused on the cancer cell. What's wrong with the cancer cell? What genes are wrong with the cancer cell? Why does the cancer cell uh, proliferate? Why does it divide, et cetera, et cetera? But over a century ago, a, a second group of scientists, a group of researchers, a group of doctors began to wonder well, why not just worry about the cancer cell? Why not worry also about the environment, the home that the cancer cell is? In other words, about the patient, the person. The person, but in fact, the tissue of the person. Mm -hmm. Because cancers, what's interesting about a cancer is, I mean, there's some very basic questions. Why do some cancers only metastasize to some organs and not to other organs? Mm -hmm. Why does uh, breast cancer or lung cancer have a propensity to go to the bone? Why does myeloma, uh, which could live anywhere, Mm -hmm. love to live inside the bone and the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. Why does leukemia live in the bone and the bone marrow? So there are reasons, and the reason has to do with interactions between the cancer and its microenvironment, the, the tissue or the home that the cancer builds around itself. So what you're saying is you take our own immune system. That's right. And it's called immunotherapy sometimes, but now it's gone beyond that because you're gene editing our immune system to actually hunt down the exact right cancer. Exactly right. So our work and other people's work involves using gene editing to mm -hmm. change the microenvironment of the host, either to activate the immune system and thereby kill the cancer, or to change the immune system of the host or the blood system of the host, such that the cancer becomes visible to the immune system. So all of these fall under a, under a large family uh, of ideas, which has to do with use whatever technology, gene editing, antibodies, etc., but concentrate not just on the cancer cell, but on the home that it builds around itself, mm -hmm. on the tissues that it occupies, and ask the question, what is it about the host? What is it about the patient that is allowing the cancer to flourish? You just talked about gene editing. And there are really two types of gene editing. Those that uh, edit early stage embryo so that it's an inherited change in the gene. And those that just try to uh, do it in the body of the patient and a particular tissue. Which ones are you using now? So we are using exclusively gene editing in cells that will never be transmitted to the next generation. This so is, it's safer. So it's, well, not only that it's safer, it's actually ethically permissible. We're, we're working on an international framework to figure out whether or not to, and to what extent to, make changes in sperm and egg cells and in embryos, so-called germline cells, uh, cells that will transmit the information not just into you, but into f generations to come. You say that's ethically problematic. Why is it ethically problematic to change our genes so that our children will be healthier? Well, the question is whether the ch that, that is really the biggest, biggest question. Can you change genes? Under what circumstances can you change genes so that, the, so that your children will be healthier? Well, one, one idea which has become very clear is that there has to be a disease of extraordinary suffering involved. But these arguments are going on right now. There are other ways that you can decide to, to treat some children. So there are other alternatives. The question of extraordinary suffering is, is, is very important. And perhaps the most important is that we don't know all the side effects of changing genes in the germline. We don't know exactly how accurate it is. It seems to be pretty accurate and pretty safe, but we need a lot of experiments. We, need, we really need a, a kind of international agreement to figure out whether this is going to be permissible or not permissible, and what should be the index case. In China, you have one rogue doctor doing it last November. That's right. In Russia right now, Correct. you have a doctor about to do three different uh, cases. 
just to cure congenital deafness in the germline. Why are you talking about creating this whole consensus when doctors are just going to go ahead and do it in some places? Well, doctors are going to do it in some places. They will do it in ways that are not, uh, that are not technically safe often, and that will set back the field. I'll remind you of what happened with gene therapy. So in the 1990s, uh, there was an attempt to do gene therapy on a young boy named Jesse Gelsinger. Yeah, in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, right. So, and uh, this uh, seemed, the experiment seemed relatively technically feasible. It was moved through various uh, uh, boards and authorities to make sure that it was uh, safe. In fact, what turned out was that the child died as a consequence of gene therapy. But it set the whole field back by about 10 years. You say it should only be used in cases of extraordinary suffering, meaning our editing of our genes for our children and children's children. Why? Why not do it so that you could be taller or blonde or whatever you might want to be, blue-eyed? I think the, the question of enhancement, first of all, is not technically easy. It's, 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 it's a vast technical problem. People underestimate it. It's not as if I can insert or take a gene away or edit a gene from a genome and allow you to grow wings mm -hmm. uh, or even enhance your height. Um, we now know for most normal human beings, height is controlled probably by a hundred odd genes, uh, maybe more, thousands of genes. Uh, most complicated features, most complex features that we have, skin color and height, among other things, are controlled by hundreds, if not thousands of genes. We don't have the technology to edit thousands of genes at a time. But leave aside the technical question, the, 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 the specter of handing this technology to potentially people who are wealthy and powerful and leaving behind people who are not wealthy and powerful and cannot afford or access these technologies creates the possibility of a genetic rift in society, which I think most reasonable people would think is it, it divides human beings rather than unites human beings. And I think that's where a lot of the ethical conundrums come. Do we, wanna, do we really want a genetically divided society? That is a big deal. That is a human species altering itself. That is the prospect of, a, as John Silston, the biologist, said, that is when a machine begins to change its own manual. Mm -hmm. We, I think, are not ready to be the machine that changes its own manual. We're not ethically ready. We're not technically ready. We're not scientifically ready. We are not prepared as a culture, as a, I, I, it's the right word to use, as a species. We're not ready to start changing our own manual. You're an expert in blood cancers. Uh -huh. Suppose we knew that a child had a predisposition to leukemia, yeah. some form of leukemia. What do you do? Well, we are now beginning to understand what to do with, with someone with such a predisposition. We, would, we are now finally beginning to figure out how to monitor them um, and whether that monitoring actually will end up saving their lives. Um, so there are many, many children where we now know that there are genes that will predispose them to, to leukemia. There, we have identified some of these genes. It is not a, it's, it's not an easy answer um, because you don't want to overtreat patients before they have the disease. There is clearly an environmental and a, and a chance component to the disease, so you don't want to treat a person who doesn't have a disease. But you also don't want to ignore the fact that they have a propensity which is increasing perhaps every year to have the disease. So now there are, now that we have all this information, there are, I would tell you, literally tens and dozens, perhaps hundreds of clinical studies trying to figure out exactly what to do with people with a predisposition for the disease, but who don't have the disease itself. So if you saw somebody with a predisposition to such a disease, could you genetically engineer, say, the bone marrow in that body, take it out of the body, genetically engineer it, reinsert it back in, so it would be less likely to get a cancer? Uh, in principle, you can do that, especially if it's a single gene. In principle, you can do absolutely that. Again, it's, it, can be, it can be technically challenging. It depends on the exact gene. It depends on whether it will be amenable to doing things like editing or not. But in principle, you could do exactly that, you could, in, especially for blood diseases. Blood diseases are important because they have this unique capacity, which is not true for most diseases, that you can take the bone marrow out, you can re-engineer it in the laboratory, and then insert it back in. And I'll give you some examples of, of what's happening in this arena. Take a disease like sickle cell anemia. So uh, not a leukemia, but a terrifying form of anemia. 
we now have technologies to take blood from an individual, take it out, modify them genetically, either introduce the correct gene or correct the gene that's already a problem, and then put it back into a patient's body. These trials are ongoing. It will be, it, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that in the next 10 years, this will be the practice uh, for disease like sickle cell anemia. Again, single gene disease. You talk about gene therapies that are done in the body, uh, like changing the bone marrow, the our immune system, or uh -huh. our, you know, white blood cells. And you speak of it as a drug, yet these treatments now cost more than a million dollars. Are you worried that these will bankrupt our entire health system? Or how do we even approve them as, quote, drugs, when they're not like drugs where you just manufacture it in New Jersey and package it up and people buy it at the pharmacy? That's right. So this is a conundrum, and it's the center of the conundrum of this piece that I just wrote in The New Yorker. So we used to be able, in the past, to be able to divide the world of medicine into procedures and drugs. Mm -hmm. What's amazing about these cellular therapies, including genetic therapies, is that they live in between. They're in this in-between land. On one hand, they are procedures because you have to take cells out of the body, manipulate them in, the, in, a, in, a, in a petri dish or in the laboratory, grow them up, and then inject them back into the body. And it requires a lot of artisanal work, a lot of manual work, hand work, quality control. So the, the, the blurring of these boundaries is, is, is happening right now. The problem, one of the central conundrums, is that these procedures drugs, these drugs slash procedures, costs around $400,000 uh, if you take in all the hospital costs involved. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that you could be in the hospital, you have complications, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if we were to start having these, and, and, and some of them are curative. So if we were to use, start using them, it would soon start amounting to several billion dollars. Um, and it's hard to say that they're useless because they're not. They're useful things we're doing. We're actually helping patients. So the conundrum of how to price these properly, how to understand these properly, and how to, to bill for them properly, without bankrupting Medicare is a huge conundrum. So you've cured people of cancer, but some of these procedures, 400,000 up to a million dollars, yes. right? Yes. So who gets it? Only people who can afford it? Absolutely. I mean, you have to have, first of all, the person who's paying or the, the, is ultimately insurance if you're insured. But as you know, many, many people in this country are not insured. So you won't even have access to these, to these medicines. What about Medicaid, Medicare? Should they cover it? Um, well, I think, again, if it's useful and if it's valuable, Medicare and Medicaid should cover it. So how long would it take to bankrupt Medicaid and Medicare if you did it? It, it, depends, on, it depends on how many of how many such drugs there are. Right now, most of these are for rare diseases, uh, but they're actually rapidly moving. To you, leukemia, which is not all that actually, rare. So, 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 the, so, so the work that we do has to do with leukemia, and it's actually not that rare. In fact, there's a pre-leukemic condition before you have leukemia, which we're now attempting to do, and is just as lethal, by the way, mm -hmm. very lethal condition. We're trying to use that. So that would already expand the number of patients to about 20, 30,000 patients a year. Okay, I can't do the math real well, but let's say it's a million dollars and it's 30,000 patients. That would be a big, big blow. Uh, no, it would totally just end Medicare and Medicaid if you did that. Th that's right. So, those, those, that, so, so we have to find a new system. I mean, either we go bankrupt yeah. or we really innovate, not just scientifically. The scientific innovation is, is on a fire hydrant right now. Mm -hmm. but, but that said, w w w the manufacturer costs will probably come down at least five to tenfold. Um, that's the prediction for most people I work in the field. Uh, we are making rapid engineering innovations. It's not the kind of innovation that hits the front page of the New York Times. It is things like, you know, how do you automate? How do you, uh, how do you use robots? How do you use quality control? Small iterative improvements, none of which make the cover of the New York Times or Science or Nature magazine, but in fact bring the costs down chip by chip by chip by chip by chip so that you can get to a point of time when it's affordable. When you say we, that we're bringing the price down, we're doing, you're partly talking about yourself not only as a scientist, but as somebody who has started 
drug companies, pharmaceutical companies yourself, and you're making money. When you write about this, when you write in The New Yorker about it, when you propose things, how do you resolve sort of the conflict of interest in a way between you having a drug company trying to do it and you trying to advocate that the FDA do different rules? So, so in my case, the companies emerged from the laboratory, but they're not drug companies yet. These are companies that are, that are not selling any medicines. They, we are making medicines. We're in early clinical trials. We, so one of them is called Vor Biopharma. There's another one called Fiat. These are not selling drugs. The minute these companies sell drugs, Drugs to human beings, um, the conflicts of interest lines go up very strongly. Uh, these are not publicly traded companies. They're companies that are completely privately, that actually they're running partly out of my own labor and, and money. So, so there are strong distinctions between conflicts of interest that happen when you are no longer an inventor but the seller of something. I'm an inventor. Um, so, uh, and they're very, very explicitly declared in, in, in a piece like this. In a piece like this, I will tell people, you know, I'm doing this myself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the middle of doing this myself. And, and, and in the world of science, writing about things that you're doing yourself, even if th that has commercial value, is not a conflict of interest. The minute, the minute that drug becomes a pharmaceutical product, it's going out into people and 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 is being priced and charged. Uh, it becomes a conflict, and that's when a barrier will come up, and never again will that piece be written. So, gene therapy, genetic editing, cancer research. What gives you the most hope in the next ten-year time frame? Well, well, I think what's what's happening is that that these fields, immunotherapy gene editing, cancer research, cancer epidemiology, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully cancer prevention will come together. Will come together in ways that we, some, some ways that we are predicting, but in some ways that we are anticipating. So just to give you one example, for breast cancer, and this is recent data, for breast cancer, we can now begin to predict for people who have familial breast cancer, people who we know that there is a family history of breast cancer, we can predict with quite a high level of accuracy your propensity to get breast cancer in the future. And now there are going to be, in the next few years, dozens of studies to try to figure out how to stop this person from getting breast cancer. Do we give them a medicine? Do we monitor them extensively? Do we take a blood test and try to figure out the minute they get breast cancer, do we treat them? So the whole idea of cancer prevention, meeting genetics, meeting early detection, becoming a whole, meeting cancer epidemiology, becoming a whole, that's what gives me the most hope, that we would create a new, based on science, we would create a new ecology of trying to build up this pyramid again from prevention to early detection to treatment so that fewer people get treatment and less toxic treatment. Most people get prevented and some people get detected early enough so that we can actually treat, and, uh, treat uh, the cancer at its earliest possible phases. Thanks for giving us hope, Sid. My pleasure. See you later. See you later.